I'm Claire Brindis, and I'm the director of the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies, and I'm very delighted to welcome all of you to the Chancellor's Health Policy Lecture. And uh, this lecture series was established with the support of Dr. Steve Schroeder, who we're very fortunate to be with us today, and it was established by Chancellor Mike Bishop a number of years ago to really highlight the importance of health policy in all of our work, particularly with the complexities of the healthcare system and the political system and how it really interacts with us, whether we're researchers or educators or community partners. In every facet of our work, health policy has a major impact. I'm really honored to give you a few words uh, on Sam Hawgood, who is our current chancellor, who joined UCSF as a research fellow in 1982 and maintained his own NIH-funded laboratory all the way up to year 2015. He's an internationally renowned neonatologist who also served as chief of the Division of Neonatology, then later became the chair of pediatrics, and I had a pleasure of having him as my chair. And then he was also chief um, of the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. He began serving his term as dean of the School of Medicine in 2007 when he was the interim dean, officially becoming the dean and vice chancellor for medical affairs in the year 2009 through 2014. He's a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Association of Physicians, and in 2010 was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. He is also, by the way, chair of the Association of Academic Health Centers. So uh, when we look at Sam, we know that he has broad shoulders. He carries a lot of different responsibilities. Under his leadership, the school has become the top medical school in the nation and research funding from the NIH, with many of our departments leading the nation in a variety of fields, reflecting the caliber of the many scientific research efforts underway, both by our faculty and our staff. As chancellor, he oversees the entire 5.45 billion UCSF enterprise, which also includes top-ranking schools in dentistry, nursing, and pharmacy, as well as our graduate division and affiliated hospitals. So it's great honor for me to welcome Sam Hoggett. Thank you. Thank you, Claire, and uh, thank you for your ongoing leadership. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to be here uh, this afternoon to uh, continue to bring outstanding health policy leaders to UCSF. Um, they help provide us uh, different perspectives from their vantage point on current health policy issues and help highlight the important role that health policy plays in the lives of our faculty, fellows, residents, and students. Uh, we continue to face challenges in the current political climate. However, I'm buoyed by my colleagues here at UCSF who have dedicated themselves to ensuring that the framework for healthcare is unbiased and to breaking down roadblocks that restrict services to those in need. It is the very work being done by you in this room, as well as the work performed by leaders such as our speaker today that will bring us through to the next solutions in health. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's uh, lecturer, Dr. Robert Califf. Rob is the Vice Chancellor for Health Data Science and the Director of the Center for Integrated Health Data Sciences at Duke Health. And he is also the Donald F. Fortin Professor of Cardiology in the Duke University School of Medicine. Rob served in President Barack Obama's administration. R remember that. Uh, at that time, he was the FDA commissioner from 2016 to 2017, following his term as the deputy commission, commissioner for medical products and tobacco. Prior to joining the FDA, Rob was a professor of medicine and vice chancellor for clinical and translational research at Duke, where he was also the founding director of the Duke Clinical Research Institute. It was here that Rob led many landmark clinical trials, and he soon became one of the most frequently cited authors in biomedical science. In June of 2017, he joined the senior management team of Verily Life Sciences, just down here, down the road in South San Francisco, a member of the Alphabet family of companies uh, spun out of Google. 
Rob wrote in a blog post of his taking a role at Verily, and I quote, Although we are in the midst of an explosion of capability in the worlds of computing and information, we have not yet learned how to effectively translate this capacity into better health and health care. Bridging this gap is at the heart of what I'm hoping to accomplish. So that's certainly a very familiar theme to many of us here at UCSF. And maybe we can take a little bit of a credit for that kind of thinking as Rob completed his internal residency here before returning to Duke to complete uh, his training in cardiology. So we're very happy that the weather has finally become a non-issue and allowed uh, Rob to join us here to give the 2018 lecture in health policy. Thanks uh, much for that uh, kind introduction, and it's it's great to be here with you and to be back at UCSF. For those of you who don't know it, we're great beneficiaries as a family of UCSF. Our uh, daughter was born shortly before coming to, to uh, San Francisco from North Carolina, and Paul Ebert did a really miraculous major operation when she was four months old. <clears throat> Holly Smith, our chair of medicine at the time, really sort of nursed us through that episode, and also some great friends like Ralph and Claire Brendis, and we've been lifelong friends ever since. So I have nothing but great memories of my time here. And now I think about it every day because half the time we live in the Presidio in the old Marine, Merchant Marine Hospital. And when I go out to get in my car, I look at the hospital on the hill here and uh, have great memories. What I'm going to do is to talk about this issue of the intersection of technology and medicine. And it's sort of hard to do this at this place because you are in the heart of it. But um, I'll do my best and hopefully raise some questions that will be of interest. I sort of enjoy talking about my conflicts of interest now because for a lot of what I have to say, I would say that my role at Duke University is more of a conflict than, than my role with what you would traditionally call the medical products industry because uh, at the core of the use of technology in changing health, I think disruption of the current model of fee-for-service medicine is probably the most important single um, issue right now and how to do that uh, responsibly. So what I'll do is to give you a, uh, just a brief primer on the FDA, because of people I've learned uh, like to hear about it and maybe get you to think about the FDA in a different way than you have before. And then I'm going to race through some slides to tell you stuff you already know, but just some pictures to solidify it, and then uh, raise some policy issues that I hope you will um, engage in some discussion about, assuming I can talk fast enough and click the slides fast enough. And then uh, at the core of this is really something Claire and I talked about. I, I originally sent her the title of my talk, and she said, no, 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 this is about you know, national health policy. And I said, you know, national health policy is interesting, but the most important stuff is what you're doing in your own health system. Uh, because a lot of people are going to be watching it, and this is where the rubber uh, meets the road. And certainly what a lot of people like to call business decisions now I regard as policy decisions. They're really decisions that are made based on what you believe in and what you think the future will hold. So just first, a quick run through the FDA. We had this big debate right when I arrived at the FDA over how much of the economy the FDA regulates. And little did I know that there are over 30 PhD economists at the FDA. The reason for that is that every time there's a significant uh, rule or um, guidance that affects uh, economics at a certain level, you have to do the workup of uh, the cost and the benefits. That has to be ultimately approved by OMB. So we had a lot of firepower to figure this out. And it turns out the answer is about 20 percent. You know, I was very disappointed it's not 25 percent, but uh, that's the way it is. So what is it that we regulate? And certainly coming into this, I was not an expert on cosmetics or food, but this, these two things are over half of what the FDA uh, regulates. It's an enormous um, effort and massively underfunded, and even more so since these are not supported by user fees. So um, in an era of people not wanting to pay taxes, uh, this part is under significant duress. Unless you think the cosmetics are unimportant, I would ask you, this sunscreen that you're slathering on babies from birth to prevent melanoma, 
uh, what's the evidence that you actually are preventing melanoma? It's a little shaky, it's probably right, but how much chemical are you absorbing into these babies' bloodstreams and what are the effects? The FDA is severely handicapped in its ability to look at that question by the way the law works in that arena. And I think everybody's aware of the importance of food. But the most underfunded part of the FDA is the Center for Veterinary Medicine. So critical now that we live in the world of One Health, where with metagenomics you can look at what's happening in the guts of animals in Southeast Asia and see the transmission of plasmids to the U.S. population in a very short period of time, or the issue of um, uh, genetically engineered animals, uh, food uh, uh, made to order. I still love the idea of bacon on a stick. Being a good southerner, I love bacon. Um, but you know, if you can uh, make it through genetic engineering, to me that would be better. Some other people feel differently about that. Um, pills, uh, you know, I won't dwell on that because everybody thinks about drugs with the FDA. Devices, a very fast growing area and a place where the rubber meets the road with regard to digital technologies. Uh, biologics, also rapidly changing and a lot of combinations now of these various drugs, devices, and biologics. And then finally, not to be forgotten with Steve Schroeder here. Steve, by the way, also nursed me through part of the internship. He was one of the attending physicians on a rotation. It was a great um, experience. But people tend to forget that the FDA really couldn't regulate cigarettes until the Obama administration. And it had to go like a startup from zero employees to uh, over 800 in a period of about five years uh, with tremendous power and a lot of interesting policies in play now. But still estimated about 450,000 Americans will die this year from tobacco-related uh, illness, so a major issue. So that's what is regulated. What about the goals of regulation? Uh, issue number one is safety. Um, in this day and time, I think it's critical to remind people of the history of how the FDA has gotten the authority that it's gotten. And almost 100% of the time, people say, we don't need to regulate, people can self-police, we'll take care of it, you can trust us. I'm not quoting anybody from Silicon Valley now in particular, but you might hear refrains like that. Um, and then a catastrophe happens, like, um, the original case was a horse named Jim that was being developed in, that was being used in 1906 for uh, the development of antitoxin. The horse got infected and some children died. That led to the uh, some of the original legislation. But then you had sulfonilamide where um, samples going mostly to the southeast pediatricians were um, basically uh, uh, contaminated uh, with lethal stuff. And then you had thalidomide, the Dalkon shield, et cetera. So um, safety is uh, job number one, but uh, tobacco is job number two right now. But right there with safety is advancing public health by speeding innovation. And this is where um, in my job offer from President Obama, he spent 10 minutes telling me how much he hated Duke basketball. <laughs> and then he spent 20 minutes telling me how much it was critical to regulate the development of technology but not to impede the innovation which uh, he saw as critical to the future, uh, not only the health of America but also um, the economy of America. So how to blend these two things, protecting and innovating at the same time is critical. And then this next part, people tend to forget. The FDA has an, an enormous job of just explaining things to people. And it's unimaginable how hard it is to write like a label for food that has to be interpreted by 320 million people speaking different languages with different uh, uh, levels of uh, reading capability, for example. So this is an enormous job. It's hard enough to get doctors to understand instructions and then you're dealing with uh, the entire public. It's a huge job. And then the last one, which I had uh, really not thought about much, but spent more time than I expected, the two big threats uh, to our safety and security now being um, biological um, effects of uh, uh, terrorism and nuclear attack, both of which uh, take an enormous toll on federal agencies right now to be prepared for a public which doesn't necessarily want to think about it or deal with it um, ahead of time. You know, it's, it's fascinating to see this, you know, not part of it anymore to read about 
the thinking in California where everybody pretty much knows what to do about an earthquake, but um, as we saw in Hawaii, uh, when the alarm goes off for a nuclear attack, it's so unthinkable that uh, people have a hard time planning or knowing what to do about it. So um, the reason that, um, you know, I think maybe I'm qualified for this lecture, um, it, it's a fascinating thing. People think of the FDA as a regulatory agency, and it is, but it's equally as much a science agency, and this is critical because, in case you hadn't noticed, people have a tendency to want to sue the FDA whenever they don't get a decision that they like. And a critical element of uh, food and drug law is that um, the courts defer to the FDA because of its history of being a science-based agency, which is a key reason why political appointees should not be making decisions about individual products, something that I've found very hard to explain to people who wa want the commissioner to intercede on all sorts of things. That would be extraordinarily dangerous because if a politically appointed commissioner could do it, um, then any judge would feel perfectly okay with saying, I can make a decision as good as a politician, so um, I'll do it. There's a long history that's uh, built into this that needs to be understood. And then um, it's a public health agency, and uh, when people attack uh, federal government employees, I think I've gotten pretty good at taking them out because um, the strength of the dedication to the public health at a place like FDA is palpable. Academia, not so much. Uh, there's a lot of ego involved here, in case you hadn't noticed, and a small amount of narcissism comes into play. Um, for the most part at the FDA, people come to work every day and don't expect to be acknowledged, but uh, work as a team on projects to serve up answers to questions that are in the public health. It's complicated and it's imperfect, but that's at the core of it. All right, so that's a little bit on the history of the FDA, which gave me the background from which I talk now. And the problem we have before us is that, and it's in play every day at the FDA, is we have so much data. How do we figure out how to siphon all this data and have something useful that comes out of it? And I, I uh, do think that the uh, World Economic Forum's fourth industrial revolution concept is a useful way to think about it. And maybe I'm overplaying it because of the work that I'm currently doing. But just to remind you, you know, the first industrial revolution, water and steam power, you know, imagine the world of the 10 years before uh, steam power was first developed, what people were thinking about how to optimize what they were doing. And then along comes electricity, the second industrial revolution, same thing. It was probably not imaginable to people 20 years before electricity became a big deal, um, how much more work could be done um, per uh, unit of human activity. And we're just recovering now from uh, information technology as a revolution, but this is information technology as best I understand it, really designed to optimize the function of an individual. I mean, we could argue whether email in, in the end is uh, helping us to function optimally, but um, if we think about the communication system now compared to what existed um, when I was an intern, um, it's really quite remarkable. And now, of course, the fourth industrial revolution is um, characterized by this uh, merger of biological, physical, and information into one entity. Now, it's not quite at the Ray Kurzweil uh, situation yet of singularity, but um, it's really evident that the world is changing very dramatically right before us. And the question, I think, for places like this is, uh, are we gonna steer it in a good direction for people, or is it gonna veer out of control uh, in a bad direction? There are high expectations, as evidenced by all sorts of lay press. I'll just show, this is just one example. So now, just to paint the picture of where I think we are, we're on the cusp of something uh, really, really dramatic that will impact healthcare. Up until now, almost all biomedical research has been fundamentally limited by the concept that because of limitations of computing, storage of information, and analysis, and measurement, we simply had to look at one part of the elephant at a time. And we could always talk about the holistic person, but we put that together synthetically in our brains and we couldn't do it through computation. But now if we go across the spectrum of uh, things that we can measure, 
And you know, this is, I love this slide because it's like the ultimate conflict of interest. I went from designing the study as an academic at Duke to being the sponsor of the study, but also being a faculty member at both enrolling institutions. But a simple way to think about this is uh, if in 2007 I had told you that you would get into your car and you would talk to your car, your car would talk back to you, and it would change what it said about where you should go based on everything happening in the entire United States simultaneously. You, I think most of you would have said there's no way that could happen. Some of you might have been able to see that that was inevitable. And the question now for the human condition, uh, technology is not the limiting factor in the ability to measure. And so we're doing this study called Baseline, which is intended to employ all the power we can to measure everything we possibly can. For example, in the first two days of intensive uh, biological measurement, it's six terabytes of data per person uh, enrolled in the study, but that's just the beginning. And everybody goes home with um, uh, digital technologies meant to measure things as much as possible continuously um, in their everyday life. Obviously, we've made tremendous progress in terms of health system, health care uh, measurement. It's not a new thing. Um, the HMOs figured this out a long time ago. I call this a Walmart slide because basically what we're talking about is every time you touch the system, there's a digital footprint. That digital footprint is measured. Uh, you have much more power if you uh, measure things centrally and then apply uh, heterogeneity techniques to understand the local application and vice versa. So it's a system measurement. And as much as I hate to show a Kaiser slide in front of the other Dr. Brendis who has always stood up for Kaiser and I've always attacked it for a variety of reasons. Um, I think Kaiser really showed the way um, with the concept that you um, aggregate information uh, centrally and then you deploy that information locally, um, considering the local environment in the form of decision support. Obviously, this same slide now could be shown for every single academic health system uh, in the country. We're in various phases of implementation of this, but to run the business, you simply have to do this. And the question is, how much can we take advantage of this ubiquity of information to do things that are useful to people? This is very much built into the uh, FDA uh, paradigm and the hopes for the future. This is a look at the world as the FDA has seen it um, in the past. We have this really crappy surveillance system where most of the bad things that happen to people because of medical products are not well understood. Academic centers, I might add, do a really lousy job of reporting adverse events. There are a lot of reasons for that. We talked earlier this morning. And um, it, a lot of it's because we have this parallel system where the information in clinical practice was so bad that you couldn't depend on it for anything that would be reliable. Still seems odd, you, you know, you'd have to say that in the face of the fact that we make individual patient decisions every day based on this information. But in the future, the hope would be that um, there would be more of a national system where data would be shared, surveillance would be active, built into the uh, health system records, and it would be automated. And this would be the same system that would be used to do uh, clinical trials and prospective studies of various types. In another uh, not-for-profit conflict, I'm also chairing the board of the PCRF as the PCORNET system funded by your tax dollars and your insurance money spins out into a private not-for-profit. The question that was raised at the beginning by PCORI was, if you took each of these systems that I just described, each working hard, and I'm sure, I, you know, I don't know all the details about the University of California system, but working really hard to develop both a business model and a healthcare model based on good information shared among all the constituents within the system, um, how much power would you have if you uh, linked those systems together, shared the information, and coordinated the information? And, um, you know, the interim report is you could have a lot of power. But the uh, key element that was brought in, which I think will be one of the disruptive forces, uh, it already is, but increasingly in the future, is patients themselves. And it was so noticeable at the FDA, the areas where technology is moving the fastest for the benefit of people are areas where they're highly organized patient advocacy groups who take matters into their own hands. So 
if you are a doctor caring for people with cystic fibrosis now, you'd better pay attention to what the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation says your quality measures are. You'd better report them, and if you're not participating, uh, they'll send a message to patients to not go to see you. Uh, the result of that is just an explosion of therapeutics because the data are shared and uh, you have patients looking for trials rather than trials looking for patients. And I could go down the list, but you know, one of the comments I made at FDA that got a little people a little stirred up is that I would not want to have a disease with a lousy advocacy component because so much of the financial um, reward now is, is built through the pull through. And there are good and bad things about it, but mostly good, I would say. So let's say you actually had academic health systems that were willing to share data. Actually, according to Joe Biden, the biggest problem now is academic health systems. I won't say it's according to me, but actually, maybe I will. Uh, there's a lot of talk, not much action here, but let's say you had academic health systems really willing to share data, and they were aligned with patient groups who had an interest, and, and their healthcare uh, clinicians who had an aligned interest to understand quality and develop the best systems. And, you know, this one coordinating center is kind of BS. It's uh, one of our PR slides from Duke, but let's just say whoever was coordinating uh, this activity you could have a lot of power. And so in Upper Cornet now, we've got um, a number of patient groups, and I won't dwell on this, and also 34 health systems who are sharing data, sweetened by um, nice uh, grants of money coming from uh, PCORI. And the end result is we're now curating electronic health record data um, you know, for the common elements for the common things in 122 million people. So this is about a third of America. But the task now is not can you have some data in 122 million people, how do you turn this into a highly functional organization that actually answers the questions that people care about instead of just what the academics care about, which has been a major problem, or just what the medical products industry cares about. Okay, so that's the health system part of it. Um, this is just a look at something you all are participating in in many ways, but we're all wearing all kinds of gadgets and things. The technology is not where it needs to be yet, but it's very much within sight that the measurement using the time axis of all sorts of things that we simply couldn't measure before is now entirely possible. And in the baseline study, we're measuring sleep, we're measuring 17 parameters with a watch, and uh, the Android phone measures a whole bunch of things that um, uh, are interesting uh, and I think important to people. Tom Insel, I think, has written the best article about this. I'd highly recommend it if you haven't read it on digital phenotyping. And I still uh, love the idea that you can tell so much about the state or condition of a person based on just the way they talk, not the actual content of the speech, but the pace of the speech, the tone of the speech, the change over time. It's a term called prosody. I didn't know what it meant until the article uh, came out. But um, as you begin to think about this, the dimensions um, in which you can measure things are profound. And then, of course, we've got the fact that everybody's on search. Raise your hand if you haven't done a search in the last 24 hours. I've talked to something like 40,000 healthcare professionals since leaving the FDA, and it's like less than 1% haven't done a search in the last 24 hours. And so you begin to think about what is the information content of your searches about you. Pretty profound, very sensitive. Um, but if we could have the right rules of the road, maybe incredibly useful in helping you uh, live a better and more productive life. So we can aggregate information at the biological level, at the clinical level, and now we can put it into geospatial context very easily. I love the maps that Chris Murray and his team put together, and I'll have to say we're having a meeting that I can just hardly wait for of the whole Google empire and Chris Murray and the Gates Foundation to see what could be done if you brought everything to bear in the context of both time and geospatial orientation. But for those of us in the southeast, this is not a pretty picture. This life expectancy, red is bad. Um, it looks a lot like the election map, doesn't it? 
And in fact, it correlates very closely with the election map. <laughs> uh, you know, even more disturbing is that if you look at the trajectory, we have two countries from the point of view now. I mean, there are eight countries, as Chris wrote a great, and team wrote a great article about this, but for simplicity's sake, you can pretty much divide America into counties that are living longer and having more productive lives in counties that are headed the wrong direction. And it's a very substantial effect, very closely tied to political affiliation and a number of economic um, determinants. Uh, Larry Summers group has a great article about to come out <coughs> that tries to make the case that the total uh, non-employed rate is the biggest predictor of the health trajectory of counties, not just unemployed, but non-employed in aggregate um, as a big predictor. And then we say, um, this is a, I used to talk about this, talking about people that didn't look like me uh, when I talked about disparities. But now, if we look at uh, every economically developed country for uh, middle-aged uh, men and women, deaths from diseases of despair, the U.S. is dramatically different and rapidly heading in the wrong direction. And the net effect is that we're diverging from countries who are economically like we are in a very negative direction. And it astounds me, I give a lot of talk to lay people, things like raising money for universities, and um, people still, I think, have a hard time absorbing this message because there's a belief that we have problems in America, but um, we're fundamentally doing pretty well. Uh, in terms of health statistics, it doesn't look that way. But lest you think I'm not concerned about California, too, um, in recent publicly available data, the differences in counties among states was made clear. And uh, there's an eight-year life expectancy difference in California, depending on which county you live in. Um, obviously, we're sitting in the middle of the place where everything is wonderful and people make a lot of money and live forever and have very <coughs> functional lives. By the way, if you look at Google searches in these counties, the well-to-do counties, the top searches are uh, 401k, um, exercise equipment and uh, outfits and gifts for relatives. If you live in the counties going the wrong directions, the top searches are pickup trucks, guns, um, religious rapture and conspiracy theories about a certain president who just finished his term. So these are the two Americas that we live with, and they're right here in California. It was, uh, I met with a philanthropist yesterday who was working in Lake County, and I just made up these slides, so I was kind of amazed that she came to talk about Lake County. But, you know, very close to here, there's a county that's not doing very well. And, you know, a question for a place like UCSF is, while there are plenty of problems to attend to here, um, what are the obligations and policies that should be in place to deal with this dramatic uh, difference in uh, life expectancy? Here's Lake County, uh, war, you know, significantly worse than average for the United States, uh, right here and uh, close to all the wealth in uh, this part of California. And, of course, you've got other parts of the state that are well known for having uh, bad outcomes. We can look at it in an aggregate many ways. This is just the latest update on the slides that we're all familiar with in terms of how much we spend. But what we're getting for what we spend, for all the reasons I've gone through, is actually looking significantly worse. Um, so what looked bad before is headed the wrong direction. Despite all of our brilliance and the fact that we're inventing the technologies uh, that are making the difference. All right, so having rushed through that, here are, the, uh, here are the questions I have for you. How do we turn all of this into better health instead of worse health? I'll go through each of them again relatively quickly. First, to make the point, um, I, we had, I think, all 21st century cures, which was a little controversial, but I feel like it came out in a really good place. But the point I want to make is that the underpinnings are there in 21st century cures for places like UCSF to really jump on board and make a difference. Um, the, the, the act initially instructed the FDA to do a long list of things, and uh, through uh, a lot of interaction, we got it changed to the FDA will write guidance on a lot of things over the course of two to five years. This is a chance for you to have input to get a system that does measure things and feed them back on a more uh, consistent basis. 
and just as an example of some of the things that are um, in play, there's a lot of need to develop methods, uh, a lot of need to understand how to use electronic health record data. This is all built in as a requirement for the FDA to develop guidance that will guide the industry in what it does, which will have a big, big impact on the rest of uh, clinical research. In addition to that part of it, I think institutions like this should be very focused on um, what the uh, ethical and moral obligations are related to the use of the state. And I'll come back to this uh, later, but I'd love to see a system that was more tuned to the needs of society through proper um, discourse. And uh, for whatever reason, I feel like universities and academic health systems have not stepped up to the plate to get engaged with their communities and thinking about what the rules should be and having uh, those discussions. I think this framework that was developed at Hopkins is part of uh, the money that came through and the economic uh, crash is a pretty good framework to um, think about it, but we ought to be talking much more loudly about this as we make decisions. So again, just to reinforce it, there are a lot of things that need to happen in order for real world evidence for measurement using electronic records uh, to go to the best use, but plenty of opportunity to shape it now. And what's at stake? You're all aware, um, I shudder to even talk about this with Dr. Redberg in the audience, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, if we really had a system that could measure things, then this incessant tension that exists in America of people wanting access to products when they're sick, as exemplified by the right to try legislation, um, mixed with their incessant desire to be perfectly safe, uh, you know, could be met by moving things up in terms of letting things on the market faster if we actually had a reliable way to measure it and to do the clinical trials in the post-market uh, environment. And so I hope uh, that we can develop such a system and then use judgment on the particular type of product as to where that line uh, should be drawn. In the best of all worlds, it would be this beautiful thing where you products get on the market at the right time and then they evolve under constant surveillance, not periodic, not haphazard, but constant uh, surveillance. Then the next one, who's responsible for the integrity of information on the internet? And you know, this is my reliable slide on this, and I think it's really true. The, this field has moved way beyond what people were prepared for. Mark Zuckerberg himself on CNN said, I was just looking for a way for my friends to talk to each other, and now you're asking me why I threw the election uh, for the whole United States. And um, so uh, we've got to, uh, I think, wake up and uh, get involved in the right discussions. Um, obviously a hot topic uh, today and the question of uh, what happens to information over time I think is being answered pretty clearly. And many of you probably saw the article uh, that just came out in Science. And I think it's now empirically demonstrated that false information travels further to more people faster and lasts longer than truthful information. And so knowing that, um, who is going to be the arbiter? Who's going to decide what the truth is and um, how to clue people in to the right information, given the fact that the allure of the information is stronger if it's not truthful? Um, the simple way that I think about this, uh, and I can say this for sure now with my life at Verily, for every question that a person has about their health, there will be an answer on the internet, every single one. And the problem we have is that an untruthful, made-up answer will be more satisfying and have less uncertainty in it than a truthful answer with, uh, that's scientifically derived with all the uncertainty and caveats that you should be responsible for providing. So we've got to find a solution to that problem. And then there's the question, how do we balance this privacy confidentiality with the amazing power, I think, that will exist to change this to Americas, or, and the same thing exists around the world. And so, you know, this is where just a, a bit about uh, Verily and some of the things that we're thinking about. Um, if our goal is to make health information accessible, there is now a belief um, pretty widespread within the Google environment that we've got, we can't just throw it out there 
and depend on the world to sort through it and figure out what's truthful. On the other hand, no one wants uh, a tech company to be um, a censor of information. So we got to find some middle ground. Part of the middle ground is uh, something I'd urge you to look at carefully and give feedback on. So with, for all the major conditions that people have that they're searching on, there's now a knowledge panel that's curated information uh, from reliable medical sources, um, you know, and it's just beginning. But a place that people can go where if they say, I want to find what, you know, the experts in the field think, here's where it is. And this is going to evolve, I think, into something much larger. It's not replacing the search panel. People can still go to the search panel if they want to, but this is an option that um, is a commitment. And then you get to the question of what do you do um, if you see what people are searching on? And obviously if they are searching on how to commit a terrorist act or how to commit suicide, society has made the decision that that's not going to be um, an allowable option. Uh, but then where do you go beyond that? So we're now uh, doing a study with depression. You know, as you know, about 10% of every society has significant depression. About half of those people are not getting treated really at all around the world. If those who do get treated, it looks like it's an average of about seven years between the time they start searching and the time uh, they actually get treatment. So um, on the one hand, you'd say treatment is effective, so how can you just watch people who are depressed and not do something about it? But the treachery here, of course, is um, applying that to every condition known to man um, is uh, kind of a hard thing to figure out exactly what to do. So what we're doing is to start uh, with depression. And uh, now if it looks like you're seriously depressed, the thing pops up that says, would you like to take a survey? And it's a PHQ-9, which is a medically validated um, questionnaire for depression. And I'll just say there are a lot of people filling out the PHQ-9, probably not a surprise uh, to you. And you get referred to NAMI, which is a patient advocacy group for mental health. That's just the beginning, but this is a major place for universities, and this is just one company. There are other people doing things in this space. I would argue this is too important and too ubiquitous to leave it up to the tech companies to figure out. We need places that have schools of law and business and ethics and religion and all those components uh, talking about and thinking about how to set the rules. So then you get into the privacy and confidentiality um, issue. We, talk, we had some good discussions about this this morning over in Claire's uh, palace over there. Soon to be a, be a bit better palace, I've heard, when it moves to Mission Bay. But very problematic um, and very difficult. And what's really intriguing to me now as I'm living in the broader world is that, you know, we encase this health care information as if it's gold and has to be protected at all costs. And then the other 99% of your life is totally for sale on the Internet by law. You know, I don't know if you looked at what the Russians were able to buy, but it's a pretty interesting set of data on everybody. And, um, you know, we have to come to grips with this, and we, we cannot leave this up to the tech companies either. And I would argue, I had a chance to talk to Primer, the IRB chairs and uh, administrators a couple of months ago, and my preface, proposition to them was, let's rewrite the common rule to deal with all information that could affect your health. Let's unencase healthcare delivery information, because it's important, but it's only 1% of your life. You're much more affected by what you do every day than by what doctors and nurses do in the healthcare system until you get really sick. And of course, you're well aware that advertisers are using this other information very effectively to separate you from your wallets and uh, very targeted to your habits as an individual. So I'll skip over this, just about done. Um, then what's the role of advertising? And we could have spent the whole hour on this. Um, I lost every argument. I hate direct-to-consumer advertising for drugs. It's the law. Sort of the epitome for me was um, uh, we were not allowed to put forth uh, rules and regulations on First Amendment advertising, uh, driven advertising for drug companies because it was, there were just too many different views and it couldn't 
And then after the election, we were allowed to have an open session to talk about it and to put out some uh, guidance to put a marker down. But uh, one of the most notable First Amendment lawyers was at that meeting, and my question was, if you had an advertisement for a drug that was truthful, and it was interpreted by the public in a way that led to 100 people dying, would that be a problem? And the answer was, that's why they call it the First Amendment. I said, what about 1,000? That's why they call it the First Amendment. It's the primary rule of the land. I said, what about 10,000? And she said, this is where I have to separate my personal belief from my uh, work in the law firm. So it's saying, uh, this was a public hearing, so I'm not revealing anything confidential. Um, you know, we've got to come to grips with this because the problem is not so much the truthful part, it's the misleading part, which is what the law says, truthful and not misleading. And, um, you know, this has been going on a long time, but right now I would say the, the floodgate of advertising is wide open. Uh, the right to try legislation opens it even further for people who are the most vulnerable, that is families and individuals who are desperately ill. And this is not new, just, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't take all of my slides out of the FDA. I had to leave them in some bunker that's under the ground. But this is one of my favorite ones. There actually were snake oil salesmen, real snake oil. You could buy it on the market, advertised as a cure for all kinds of uh, diseases. And those people still exist today. And then finally, should we regulate health information technology at all? This gets into the AI issue. And I'm not going to dwell on this uh, in the interest of time, but let me just say that um, when you get to this kind of a situation where we know that the best we can do for people would be a highly adaptive health system where changes were made like MAPS, you can't freeze it and uh, interrogate it say it's okay, and then it changes an hour later, and then do that again. So, uh, you know, we've developed an approach to that at the FDA. It's still not stated how the approach is going to work, and the approach is high-quality systems, not high-quality individual algorithms, but how to regulate a system to assure that it's high-quality, given the history of people taking advantage of this in certain circumstances is a major dilemma. So I would urge uh, you all to be involved in all these things with a view that um, I think, you know, our goal should be that people should have access to clear, understandable information about the whole thing, not just medical products, but interventions and decisions about their health, and that the limitation is no longer technological. It's all cultural. And so I would urge you to get involved at policy at all levels, and while federal policy as I've said, is very important in many ways. What you do locally in your health system is probably the most important thing right now, and you're, you're in a great place to do it. So thanks. I think we have a few minutes for uh, questions and comments. Yes. Thanks for your wonderful leadership. A question about menthol cigarettes. Did you have any insights, uh, recommendations for federal action in the future? Is there anything that, any evidence or local action at states or in Congress that could move <laughs> the FDA? Thank you. Was that a planted question? Oh, that's a sore point with me. I mean, the, the evidence is clear that uh, menthol has been used to market cigarettes specifically to African Americans in urban environments as a tactic, and it's highly effective. Um, and it should, and the FDA has the power to remove uh, flavors from tobacco, and it should be done. We could not get it done uh, during my term. We tried. We could not. So I hope it happens uh, quickly. I don't think it's a this is a matter of personal freedom. I think it's a matter of addiction. It needs to be taken care of. As long as we're on the subject of smoking. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on vaping and e-cigarettes because I think there's, to me, a real tension between the evidence of harm and the evidence of benefit. Our high school, I mean, I just saw data, I guess, in the Times that like 8% of middle schoolers have, are vaping now, which I don't think is to stop smoking. And what is the role of the FDA? Yay. 
Well, I mean, the FDA has a, has a authority granted by the law to regulate e-cigarettes, but um, you know, FDA operates, as you well know, in the uh, HHS environment, despite the recommendation, I will say, of all previous FDA commissioners that it should be taken out of HHS and made an independent agency like uh, SEC to try to um, have it act as a, you know, a real public health agency. Having said that, um, I, I think the evidence is unclear. I had a chance to interrogate Steve, my uh, mentor on this, who's thought a lot about it. And I, I think we need a lot more evidence, but the one thing that's without a doubt is that it's illegal to sell nicotine products to people under age 18. I didn't know I was going to inherit, by the way, a field force of 3,000 teenagers who were actually going to 7-Elevens and trying to buy products as part of the employment pool of the FDA. But I really do think the, res the research needs to focus on this because if we have our way and we get nicotine out of the leaf, people are not going to want to smoke the leaf. And then the question is, what's the benefit of reducing use of the leaf in a way that protects people from withdrawal um, versus the risk of a whole bunch of more people becoming nicotine addicted? And if I were king, I would just say it should be highly regulated, made available to current smokers, but not other people. But I don't think that's going to fly in America. There's too much of a belief about individual freedom. Thanks for your fascinating and timely talk. I'm curious whether Verily and in your role uh, also at the FDA has uh, any focus overseas in other languages uh, for a way to expand uh, the benefits of online medicine with um, sort of cultural questions in the back of my mind. Are there any overseas projects in other languages with Project Verily? Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that just amazed me is the change in, um, uh, I call it natural language processing, but the translation. There's almost no one left that has to humanly translate, like at search, 110 languages. It's automated. So that mean, uh, so then you get to the issue of uh, the culture becomes the dominant factor in how people use the internet. Um, and we have a number of projects going on. And I do think that the rollout and the uh, method of messaging needs to be different depending on the culture. I mean, just to give one example, diabetic retinopathy screening in India, fundamentally different than the US because of the ratio of people to uh, doctors. Um, but, you know, if you use uh, uh, AI to read the scans, you can sort out better than ophthalmologists, you know, as published in JAMA, um, you know, a person with a problem that needs to see an ophthalmologist from one who doesn't. In the U.S., because of the way healthcare works, it'll look entirely different. Yes. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. The question I have is uh, how the insurance companies are interpreting this uh, data information and how the insurance companies are supporting oh. the data science because at the end of the day, they are the one who controls all the payments and everything. Yes, yeah, so the question was how do insurance companies um, deal with data science? They use it every day is what I would say with the data that they have. and. Um, you know, I have to say, I'm, uh, one, of the, one of the many things to think about here is that um, because most of the healthcare clinicians now work for a corporation, for profit or not for profit, um, where deals are made between um, those who make products, those who consume them, and insurance companies, often without a lot of transparency, is um, I think we need to really focus on transparency of those interactions because very sophisticated data science is used to determine what insurance companies do and where they go and um, you know when they move in and out of markets it's not because they're guessing for the most part it's based on data on how you can make money through insurance so a lot to be gained by transparency there. Ralph, you get the last question I guess. So Rob, you've, you've spent a lot of part of your career in focus on real world evidence and coordinated nets, uh, networks and certainly Cornet and, and your 
uh, and your talk today uh, focuses even more on such. What are some of the political challenges that you have seen and that we have to get through in terms of incorporating real world evidence, that is governance issues, uh, hiding behind patient confidentiality, uh, utilization of the data uh, from uh, the contributors and so forth. How have you gotten through some of these uh, barriers? For the most part, I haven't. <laughs> you know, what, what I'd say is that um, uh, it, I, I do believe it's a matter of time, but um, people uh, like to hold on to their data. They're worried about what people will see. I don't really think it's, confident, it's privacy so much that's the key issue here. Uh, one of Claire's young faculty made the good point that the financial incentives are stacked against sharing information right now. There are like a thousand reasons why information is not shared or used uh, to the best good of people and patients. And um, I, I do think, you know, so it does boil down to policy. I mean, people will behave according to the rules of the road. We saw this with clinicaltrials.gov. It was fascinating. And I was very involved in that. It started out, so I'll finish with this story because I think it uh, exemplifies the problem. Um, I got asked to um, be a consultant to the CEO roundtable for pharma. And their issue was they were being told they were going to have to post their trials they were doing on clinicaltrials.gov, and they wanted an argument to defeat that. And it turned out my, the other consultant had just finished with two uh, gigs. One was the oil industry, the other was the tobacco industry. And we ended up with the same recommendation, which is that people don't trust you because you're not acting in a way that should lead to trust. And that, uh, you know, when you do an experiment on a human being, that information should be publicly available, not held privately forever. Um, and so what happened was when the law got passed, it said you got to do it. Academia just acted arrogantly like, you know, we don't have to do this, um, we're too important, it takes too much time, too hard to do. Industry complied with the law and has done a much better job than academia at making the fact it's doing trials available and in posting the results of those trials uh, when they're completed. Now, thanks to other parts of the legislation that we were able to sort of push through with cures, um, everybody in academia presumably now knows that you can be fined $10,000 a day for each infraction for every day that you don't comply with the law. So we're seeing a nice uptick in academic uh, <laughs> um, effort. But um, so, so the point of all that is that um, for when it comes to sharing data, um, I do think there's got to be a bottom-up push from uh, these patient groups who have a lot at stake look at cystic fibrosis and how much better that's doing than other areas. And at the same time, we need the, the top-down, um, you know, carrots and sticks to get people um, to do it. And so um, I'm actually hopeful, it doesn't sound that way sometimes, but I'm actually pretty hopeful that we will uh, make this happen because it's going to be so hard to block it in the future. All right, well, thanks.